Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Coffee and Open Source, a place to meet some new friends, have some great conversations, and maybe even learn something along the way. I'm your host, Isaac Levin, and, well, I got my coffee today, and I'm excited for my chat. I am super, super excited for my chat today. My chat, uh, our chat today is with uh, somebody that I just met a little bit ago, and I'm excited to continue the conversation we were just having before. Hopefully, it's, uh, you folks get it as well. So my guest today is Demetrius Cheatham. Demetrius, you want to say hello? Introduce yourself. Hi. Hi, everyone. I am delighted to be here with all of you today. Awesome. I, again, introducing myself, Demetrius Cheatham. I'm the Senior Director for Diversity and Inclusion Strategy at GitHub, and I'm responsible for developing and leading the strategy across the company's four pillars, which are philanthropy, HR, policy, um, people, and platform. And so um, I've also created an open source community called All In that I have delighted to just jump in and talk with you all about today so thanks for having me yeah i, I so full disclosure i watched some of uh her pres uh Demetrius presentations that she's done on this topic and i really want to get into it but first i really want to kind of get your origin story you know it's it sounds to me like you have a ton of interest in tech ton of interest in diversity and ton of interest in open source so when did it all start for you Oh my gosh, it started. I actually went to North Carolina a and State University and I was a computer science major. I okay. am a proud, I know I'm going to date myself, C++ programmer. Uh -oh. And so I was all in the computer lab all night, just coding all day, every day. Through a series of twists and turns into my career, I got a little bit further and further away from tech. I had my JD MBA from the University of Maryland. And so I went more on to the business and legal sure. side of things. And so about three or four years ago, I had the opportunity to think about what I wanted to do in this next phase of my career. And I realized I wanted to go back to my first love, which was tech. And so funny enough story, I went to North Carolina State and took like a coding course. And it was like day two. I was like, so I do not want to do this <laughs> anymore. So I said, how can I go on to, um, you know, just more of the business side of, of tech? And so um, just thinking about the arc of my career, I've been doing a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion work for the past, you know, 10 to 12 years. And I said, there's an opportunity for me to bring my background as a programmer, as well as just some of the, you know, like skill sets and education I have. And I think that I just had something that I could give back to tech. And so I actually um, landed at Red Hat leading their diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. And that's where I truly fell in love with open source. Yeah. It's very, very hard to not fall in love with it. Like if you if you have the mindset, like yeah, about the idea of, of sharing and, and broadening everybody's knowledge, the like open source, it's like it's like just a catalyst for that. I, I, and I and I love what you're talking about as it pertains to just just different backgrounds. And I would love to kind of get your two cents, you know, and we can dr dive deeper into some of the miscellaneous topics. But like in tech, and this is going to be a really open end question, so I hope that. Uh, it's not too open-ended for you. What, so where is the biggest area of opportunity with diversity in tech? Well, that is a big, broad question. Yeah, well, I mean, we got an hour, so hopefully we'll be able to, <laughs> to, to flesh out some of it. Quite honestly, I think the biggest area for diversity in tech is all around access. And access is very closely related to equity. So you're going to hear a little bit of both. One of the things that I love, uh, just bringing it down from tech and just to open source, the thing that I love about open source is that it truly is a place where anybody can participate. Like, you know, it used to be to be a programmer into a company. You had yeah. to get that four-year degree. You had to be super this, super that. You had to be a computer science major or, or an engineer or maybe even a math major. That was usually the only pathways you had into software development. And I just see that open source broke down all of those barriers and those walls. Probably one of the most accomplished women in open source was a VP at Red Hat. Her name was Denise Dumas. and She was a history major. She led rail for them, right? Like just so amazing. So the fact that when I talk to people in open source, that they come from so many backgrounds, um, majors, walks of life, a lot of them don't even have degrees. Like that's just, just blows my mind to me. And then it just starts me to thinking anybody can do this. If we give them the tools and the access that they need, anybody anywhere can participate. 
like you can code now, get her mobile, like, you know, shameless plug and all those things. Yeah. You just need a cell phone. You don't even need like these computers and servers and go down in computer labs and basements and all those. You can do this from anywhere. And that's where I see the biggest area for us to really think through and really increase diversity in tech is just being able to get exposure and access into the hands of anybody anywhere that just has any type of interest in this. I mean, that's that's an amazing way to start the conversation. I think you know, your your comment about access is really spot on. Like I was reading an article about, you know, how like the different segments of developers and like their age groups, right? And, mm -hmm. and how they learned how to be a developer. Like obviously the older you get, like the more it's like the traditional four-year university right. or trade school or something like that. And then as you get younger and younger and younger, you're seeing more skews of I'm a self-learned developer. I went to a code mm -hmm. camp. I taught myself, like, do you see some of the capabilities that have been added in the last, let's just say, 15 years or so, you know, obviously the access of the internet now, the idea that of Web 2.0 and creating all these different learning curriculums, is that the primary reason for these sort of changes? Or is it is it more tied to some sort of social, social economic thing where people just have access to technology in general, so they're going to be more interested in technology? I think that's a very good question. Um, I think that you are starting to see an advent of a lot of things as a result of just the talent pool, the sheer yeah. number of people that we are going to need yeah. to be software developers. Your four year institutions. It looks like we're having a little bit of issues at the moment, hopefully. Are you able to hear me okay? Yeah, you, you broke up for a little bit. So if you want okay. to just repeat like the last five seconds of what you said. Yeah, I was just saying, you know, the talent pool in itself and the growth, the exponential growth that we need for software developers, your four-year institutions can't be the only source for yeah. that talent. They're going to have yes. to come from a whole lot of different places. And as diversity, in, you know, like you need just more diversity in your innovation and your products and your services and nothing, you're going to have to get that talent worldwide. Yes. And sometimes the university system isn't keeping up with that, as well as coming out of the university system, they might not be learning the practical things that we need for them to know. So not dismissing the university system, I guess so much value and I'm not sure. discouraging anybody not to go to school. But I think this needs to be kind of all hands on deck and understand that people learn differently. Like some people yep. can't go to a four year university for whatever reason. And so then all of a sudden, can we give them access and a pathway into tech if that isn't their preferred mode? So it's not to dismiss it, just to understand that there's a diversity in learning as well. Some people need the boot camps and the hands on experience. Some people need to go into the classroom environment and there's a big enough table for them all. And so I don't think that there's too many and there's always room for opportunity as well as. You know, there was something that I saw on Twitter a few weeks ago and this thing has stuck with me and, and I'm going to solve for it. And I think it's already solved. I don't even have to solve for it. Um, we were talking about summer internships and the summer internship program. And somebody on Twitter said, even that model is flawed because sure. you are pretty much eliminating people from the global South to be able to yeah. participate in this um, you know, pathway. Like their university, that isn't their summer when we yeah. are doing our yeah. summer internships everywhere else. And so here's a talent pool that we are pretty much keeping out because of the way in which our model. And so I think that our models are going to have to evolve when you're talking about corporations. So that's why I'm such a big fan of programs like major league hacking and outreachy in which the, they do these year round cohorts. That's why I yeah. like the boot camps where you can participate in it year round in the event that you can't do internships and companies can leverage those as an input into their talent pool as well. Yeah, I, I completely agree with all of that. As somebody, I went to a four-year program. I'm not saying that it's better or worse than other, but there's just alternative options. Like I think your, your point about four years is a lifetime in technology, right? Mm -hmm. Four years ago, the technology that was being used is substantially different than the technology being now. So if you commit to being a, a developer or a technologist in general four years ago, and you go through some curriculum that was built four years ago, or maybe even two years ago, if it's somewhat agile, you're still two years behind when you graduate, mm -hmm. right? So it's in it. That's not a bad thing, but it also gives you an opportunity to look at your alternatives. Like if I want to be a developer today, because I see that I can provide value today, there are options that are a bit more accelerated, not yeah. to say that they're better or worse, but I think that there is something to say about 
if you want to do a particular task, you have to learn it now and how to be able yes. to work in that field now. And and to add to that point, you're you're absolutely right. Something that I've learned as a result of this pilot that we've done as part of All In, All In for Students, not all computer science programs are created equal. This and so even the level in which people are, when they come out with a computer science degree, that means different things at different universities, right? There are some universities where students, because of, you know, infrastructure issues, lack, lack of professors, whatever it is, they might not get their first programming one-on-one -on -one course until their junior year. Yeah. So I was fortunate to go to an HBCU that had a very, and still do have one of the top computer science programs like anywhere. That's awesome. And by the time I got to my junior year, we were in electives. Like we were kind yeah. of you know, that, like yeah. the, the basic stuff was already done, but yet we still here in 2022 have students that are juniors that are just now taking their first computer science program. So how do we make sure that we are not dismissing them from the talent pool because of where they had the opportunity to go to school at? Like that might be something that is punishment to them. And we need to make sure that we are creating an environment because we need them into the workforce as well. Yeah, I think one thing also that's really important to call out is that any learning mechanism is completely dependent on the experiences of the instructor, whether that's somebody who's running a code camp, whether that's a college professor, not to not college professors, but most of their research and their experiences are with somewhat older technologies. Just that's just how things work. And yeah. if I, I just I, I had to take a class in college where I learned how to like write an ATM program and see. Like that's, I don't know how mm -hmm. valuable that is for most folks that want to get into web two or web three sort of stuff. Right. But on the flip side of that, there is some concern about things like code camps because a lot of people come out of code camps with the expectation they're going to be able to get some job at some great company right away. And some guarantee that like money back guarantee and things like that, mm -hmm. but you still risk that. Okay. I put six weeks of my time into this with the expectation that I'll be able to get some entry level job. And if it doesn't work out, it's, it doesn't work out. Right. Yeah. And you're, I mean, and even, you know, in what you share, there's still a lot of privilege in that, right? Yes. Like the privilege that, you know, you talk about the experience of instructors. There are some schools that they don't have full-time computer science, like every year yep. is turning over and or even every semester is turning over or even boot camps. A lot of them there, there are some free ones that are available. Um, but like a lot of those have a cost associated with it. Sure. So what are you doing for the folks that around the world that might not be able to afford those? And that's why yeah. I love open source, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever platform that you're using, you can create a free platform and you can go in and start participating and learning even if and and being self-taught without any money that you need yeah. to, you know, to fill out. So that's that's why I'm a big fan of open source. Yeah, I, I've had the opportunity to, to interview a, a few folks that are kind of new in career on this show. And I think mm -hmm. one of the things that I've definitely realized is that the generation that came after me, I'm in my mid 30s, the generation that came after me has substantially more hustle mindset than my generation did. So like this idea of like, I'm just going to go out and get what I want. Where else mm -hmm. my generation, maybe the generations before me, traditionally, like we wait for the opportunity, wait for the opportunity to come to us because we, mm -hmm. like you said, we had some privilege in some regard. Some people had some privilege in that regard, right? So, but yeah. now you're seeing the the younger generation say, "I want to be a developer. I'm going to go to GitHub and I'm going to create a, a profile and I'm going to clone a bunch of repos, or I'm going to, you know, pay the 15 bucks to Udemy or our Plural Site or some other online training mm -hmm. course and just I'm going to get it." because that's what I want to do and I don't have time to wait. And I think that there's something to say about I I have a total respect for the energy because the energy of being a developer is some, sometimes very challenging. Mm -hmm. So like the the opportunity that we constantly are running into is hey, like this is like it's all it's a lot of negative feedback is what I'm trying to say as a technologist, mm -hmm. right? So like just the ability to continually kind of hit your head against a wall for that one little bit of positive is like, that's really impressive for me, especially when you're doing it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, one of the reasons why I really started focused on diversity, equity, including specifically equity in tech. Um, so my daughter goes to the, uh, school. We moved back to North Carolina about three years ago Okay. and she's in this school. And I went to my first 
PTA meeting, Parent Teacher Association meeting. And I had stood up and said, hey, I work for Red Hat, da, 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 just intro. And afterwards, it was a parent that ran up behind me. It was a lady. Yeah. And she came up to me and she said, Demetrius, my daughter is going to shadow you at work. And I'm like, she didn't ask. She just told me. And I was like, OK. And she was like, let me show you her resume. Okay. And she had already told me she was in 10th grade. She pulled out a two page resume. And oh, my boy. first thought was, why does your 10th grader have a two page resume? Yeah. But OK. Yeah. I looked over it and the first quarter of those two pages, that's the first quarter of the first page. It was her name. She played softball. Yeah, what year yeah. she was. That's it. That's it. Mm hmm. The next three quarters of that first page and the whole second page were all GitHub contributions. And I said, what? Hmm. Like, I yeah. couldn't believe this. I said, I probably could take that resume and yeah. she probably can get an early entry job at any tech company sure. right now. Yeah. In 10th grade. But I also knew on the flip side, because I had been visiting some of it, that some of our minority serving institutions, a lot of them hadn't even heard of open source yet. Sure. And I said, there are some disparities in there because this younger, like not knocking her hustle at all because she was freaking yeah. awesome. She has access and exposure because her dad was a programmer and all sure. these things. Yeah. These things yeah. that others don't have. How do we bridge that gap there? And so to that point, you were making just the hustle of the, the younger generations now. You're right. It's just out of this world. Out of this yeah, world. Yeah. I, I mean, and even if you want to like go outside of tech, like the amount, like the, the, they had to create a whole like a, a content creation influencing, like those are things that sure they've been around in different mediums for a long time. But now if you are passionate enough, you can be an influence. If you have the time, you can be an influencer in whatever you have interests in. Right. Yes. You made some, yeah. you made a comment that I thought was really spot on about, about we talked about access a bit earlier. But like mm -hmm. there's different like access means so many different things in different in different scenarios, right? Like you mentioned you went to an HBCU that had a great computer science program. That might not always be the case. You mm -hmm. mentioned also different minority groups not even knowing about things like open source or having access to resources that even know about open source, right? Mm -hmm. Like what are some of the things that you're seeing happen right now uh, that are accelerating or amplifying that that moment in time, right? How like not to use GitHub as an example, but I'm going to use GitHub as an example because it's kind of like social media for tech. Um, mm -hmm. Like making GitHub more amplified to all different areas, right? So, you know, women in code, uh, black girls who code, minorities in code, Latinx in code, like all these different groups, right? Like what are they doing to try to say, hey, like you can get into tech and you don't have to go to a four-year degree or you don't have to do a code camp. You can do it yourself. Yeah, um, I think, I mean, it's almost like you asked a question and answered it all into sure, one. Sure, right? I mean, I, I do that a lot. I really, I do that a lot. But I, I want your thoughts because, to be honest, you're far more, um, you're, you're far more, I guess you could say, educated in the area than I am. I'm just curious. Yeah, um, here's what I, I want to, like, lift that question a little bit. Sure, of course. Um, to talk about all in and what I was seeing and how it came to be. Um, so... When I was hired at GitHub and what made me come to GitHub is that they said they wanted me to focus on advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion on their platform. And when mm -hmm. I started, it was 50 million developers. We're over sure. 70 million developers yeah. marching very quickly to 100 million developers. And so I remember when I got here and I was like, well, what do you all want me to do? And they were like, you are smart and we trust you. Go figure it out. And so yeah. I said, OK. I just started going around and talking to so many people, anybody that would take a meeting with me, a lot of the leaders of these organizations you just mentioned. I just wanted to hear what was going on, what they were seeing, what they were working on, challenges, opportunities, like all of those things there. And something struck me one day. I was reading something that was just telling me about the origins of open source. And when you look at the origins of open source and, and why it was created, it was because software development was being done in silos. Nobody was yeah. collaborating. It was everybody's competitive advantage. You had all of these intellectual property protections, like covering all of it. Right. You can't know what we're doing because then you're going to, you know, steal something from us. And then they created open source because they, they said that's a better way to do software development. Right. What struck me about that when I was reading that, that's exactly how diversity, equity, and inclusion is being done today. 
everybody's working on it in silos, lots of duplication of efforts. Everybody's trying to solve the main problem. And I put it in quotes because I hate to hear diversity, um, you know, mentioned being a problem. Sure. Um, you know, people not wanting to share their strategies and what's working for them because they're afraid if I share this, you're going to steal that limited talent pool yeah. that we're trying to go after as well. It's such a fixed mindset and it goes against everything that we stand for in open source. Yeah. And so that's when I started getting the thought, what if we open, applied the open source principles to diversity, equity, and inclusion in the same way we did software development? Yeah. So to the point that you're making, you do have all of these amazing programs out here. But my concern is that a lot of them are trying to solve the same small part mm -hmm. of like, how do we create more programmers and how do we get them jobs? It's so many different nuanced, you know, perspectives and aspects of that. And I just think that there's a lot that's getting lost. Like say, for instance, we, um, you know, as part of All In, we partnered with the Linux Foundation and published the open source diversity, equity, and inclusion survey last year. It's a 64 page report. Yeah. Here's what my goal was for that. And my wish for it is that people would take that report and say, I can tackle this slice yeah. of it. Slice I it can up. tackle this slice of it. You know what I mean? Instead of everybody trying to kind of solve for everything all at once, which usually ends up with everybody doing the same thing. And so if there was something that I wish that I could see in a lot of these organizations that's doing these boat camps and diversity, like, everybody take a piece of it like like and we all come together and and you know work kind of together on it in that way versus you know kind of duplication of efforts and those things i i totally agree i also think that there's something to say about like there's a lot of different organizations and programs out there that are trying to solve this larger problem but they're maybe targeting it at a particular slice of the problem thinking you using basically in, to use a really bad analogy like using jackhammers to screw in screws right or that's a terrible analogy but i guess the point being is they're trying to solve this huge systemic problem mm -hmm. with this huge systemic tool but they're targeting it at a particular small subset of the demographic right yeah. and it's and it's I, and I imagine that there's a lot of cross communication that does go on, but I, I would be curious, like you mentioned, there's a lot of silos. Is that just because everybody's just too busy trying to do the work and solve the problem or not problem? You, I try to use mm -hmm. the word opportunity, try yeah, to right. try to engage with the opportunity. Like it, or is it as simple as like, we think that we're doing it the right way. We don't need anybody else's help. And you can pass if that's if that's. Too, I'm not, if that's no, I, yeah. I'm just trying to decide how politically correct. No, I exactly, be. I exactly. That I don't want to yeah. be. Um, I think diversity and inclusion. There are some base level things that you can do, and those yeah. are some things that you can check the box and say that you're doing. Okay. So I'll give you a prime example. When I was, um, you know, we were started all in for students. We're working with our university partners, and what I started seeing, if you let's just take HBCUs for example, sure. right? Okay. And I knew this from me going to school. You have about five schools, maybe six, that everybody goes to, every single company, North Carolina A&T, Florida A&M, Howard University, Morehouse, Spelman, yep. maybe Hampton mm -hmm. University. Every company just about in the world is on their campuses. You might have schools that are 30 minutes down the street that not one company will even show up to there. So it's almost like, hey, we need to do an HBCU strategy. Just go to the place where everybody's going and we can say that we did it even though they might not get any students. So sure. sometimes when you have to go that extra level and go a little bit deeper, it, it that's when the work begins, right? And that it might does, be yeah. the work that's long-term systemic. You don't get to put your names up in lights. You don't get to make the amazing tweets because it might be a 10 year payoff. Yeah. So I'm looking at some of these smaller schools that we intentionally spoke, focused on as part of All In. When you go there, if you go there and say, oh, yeah, we want to offer these students summer internships and certifications. Mm -hmm. Some of these students still don't have laptops. Some of these schools, yeah. the infrastructure is so bad that the students can't even get on Wi-Fi. Like they're, when they have a coding assignment, they have to go and drive to the local McDonald's or the predominantly white schools so that they can and hope that the security guards yeah. don't call the cops on them. Sure. Um, you don't have professors there. Um, some of the something that I heard from some students were like, when COVID hit and we the pandemic hit and everything went virtual, a lot of people were like, oh yeah, now we're gonna hire these summer interns for everywhere and yeah. they don't have to lead. A, 
And they were like, we don't have internet at home. We live in yeah. rural parts of our state that we can't get the internet and everything was closed. So we had to sit out for summer internships. I don't think, and so when a company goes in and says, we want to offer summer internships and free certificate, that's the easy things to do. Sure. When you have to look at what you need to do to get students access to those things, you're going to go to the places that have already solved for that. Oh, and that's sure. where you end up going to the same five or six, because that's the easy work. So when you're talking about a slice of the pie, I would love to see companies come together and say, five of us are going to adopt this mm -hmm. school. We're going to work on the infrastructure issue. Yeah. We're going to work on the professor issue. We're going to work on the mentoring and the, the, the resume writing and the interviewing issue. And then all of us, because guess what? When companies make those long term investments, a lot of times they don't like to do it because usually these schools don't have a large talent pool. But sure. what happens is enrollment increases at the school because everybody knows that these companies are now part of it and they increases their likelihood of getting a job there. So you're solving so many yeah. different things. But if you have one company that goes to one small school and look at all of those issues, they'll say that's too much for us. We can't do that. But if they really come together and part open source this thing, right? Then yeah. you can start making systemic long-term change. That's how you increase the talent pool. That's how you do it. There's there's something that just hit me, and I probably somebody else will probably say, "Oh yeah, of course, Isaac." But I see what you're talking about, and I think of tech in the Pacific Northwest 30 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. At a point in time when a lot of companies decided to have tech here. Now we have universities in the area which have the best computer science programs in the world, and guess what? They are feeder schools to these large companies. Yep. I think like your your example is yeah. Let's just say company X wants to adopt an HBCU or a a smaller university in the South or anywhere yep. else in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And they build the infrastructure or work to build the infrastructure. They look to hire adjunct professors, like, and then you immediately have a feeder program. Because mm -hmm. I think one thing is very very clear, especially when we we're talking about the new generation most of them are pretty tech savvy, even with yeah. little to no access to, to technology. Like I have small kids and they, I never taught them how to use an iPad. They They're literally boring. just picked it up and they started using it. Right. Uh -huh. So I think that as the generations go, like tech is just a, an extension of their presence. Right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. being able to just point them in directions and to your point, we need people. There are too many tech jobs out there, not enough people. There's a surplus of jobs. Anybody who has interest in it is a potential candidate for a job. Correct. Right? And I think now, like, there are too many gates. Or not gates, but I might do the, the right word. But there are a lot of barriers for folks to, to at least get into these tech jobs. You're mentioning them earlier. Also, just in general, like, it's very, very challenging, even for somebody like me who has privilege – like finding jobs if I'm looking for jobs out there because the, yeah. the process, the process is so complicated, right? Yeah. I can't imagine somebody that has less privilege as me or less access than I do to be able to accomplish the same thing I'm trying to. Yeah. And you don't know what you don't know. Right. Yep. Like I love going to schools and I'll say, Hey, I'm interested in, you know, talking to your students about getting them interested in open source, da, 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 da. And they're like, well, here's our computer science students. I was like, Hey, do you have any marketing students that had yeah. to take, you know, tech courses and they did mm -hmm. really well in their program? I yeah. like to talk to them about developer advocacy roles. And they're like, what? <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. even no, how we look at these schools and engage them and, and doing all those things. But like I said, you'll have some companies or some organizations, they'll say, well, we don't know anything about writing curriculum, right? Like mm -hmm. that's the school's job or whatever. Yep. That's why I said this has to be open source. So instead of a tech company going in and say, we're going to adopt the school, I want them to bring, you know, some researchers or part of their research arm or curriculum arms of other companies or these organizations that's doing that. Really, You go in in an open source way. You create a community around the school, not just yes. one company adopting. And I think tech companies can be a leader in this space. They have the ability and the money to bring in all of these other partners so that they can focus and, and do the time. That's how I think you, I, I mean, that's me and my two cents, but I think that's no, I, how you have to approach it now because quite frankly, this, you know, lone hero type thing, it's just not working. It's yeah. just not working. There is something to say too about, you know, you mentioned again, just like people have access to different things, right? Mm -hmm. If I live somewhere 
like that has dial up internet, the chances of me ever being able to work in tech are like basically zero, right? right? Especially in the last two plus years with the pandemic and stuff not being open and not having access to things like this completely changing people's ability to mobilize themselves. Right. Yeah. Like, so yeah. how, so I guess here's a, a, a good, que- a good, another open-ended question since, since you do so well with them. So it seems to me like you have a pretty opinionated view, which I agree with about how tech companies can take some of their, um, what's the word capital, not financial capital, but just capital mm-hmm. as it pertains to influence and start to build out programs. Is there any sort of possibility of completely um, co- tech company funded university, not universities, but trade programs or like, I guess like for instance, com- let's, let's use GitHub as an example because you work there. What if GitHub opened up a college? In mm-hmm. some area, right? Some some area that they saw that there was a ton of opportunity to kind of revitalize that community, right? Like, how realistic is something like that? Um, you can't say anything is impossible, right? Sure, sure. And also, I don't want to put GitHub on blast either. It's not. I just I'm. Yeah, no, 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 GitHub. no. I didn't take it as such. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not impossible. I am a big fan of companies, regardless of their tech companies or whatever bringing who they are and their mission and what they do and what they're good at sure. to diversity, equity, and inclusion versus them trying to create and be something that they're not. Yeah. So one of the things that I do when I'm advising companies, coaching companies or whatever, if they come to me and say, hey, we're trying to solve for this diversity, equity, and inclusion, we want to do more. I look at their mission. I look at who they are, what are their products and services? How do they show up in the world? Like what's the rhythm of their business? And then I try to embed diversity, equity, and inclusion into who they already are versus creating this program over here and asking them to be something that they're not. And so to ask a tech company to all of a sudden be a university because, you know, that's a whole special thing. Sure. I I wouldn't necessarily, like I said, it's not impossible. I just wouldn't be a fan of it. What I would want to see is a company, say, for instance, making this up because I was just talking to them a Cisco, right? Like if they are really good at infrastructure and all those things, Mm -hmm. they might take five universities and say, we're going to solve the infrastructure of these companies right here. But then you might see someone like the Linux Foundation who has freaking amazing curriculum. And there's like name, uh, you know, boot camp or whatever, this amazing curriculum. Cisco and say, we've done the infrastructure for these Linux Foundation. Can you come in and offer these courses? Make sure that the students can get academic credit. I want them to like open source this thing, right? Sure, like open yeah. source it. Um, that's one of the things that I really have an appreciation about GitHub. And I always say this kind of tongue in cheek and knowing that my um, talent acquisition partners and colleagues probably cringe when I say it. With GitHub, we want to have as many developers and people in open source that we possibly can. The sure. world is I mean. We actually don't care where they go work, right? We want yeah. them to get jobs. Out. We don't care which community they like participate in. We don't care where they go work. And all. that's why I love my job and what I do. Whereas other companies, again, back to that competitive advantage, they're like, we only want to create something that creates yeah. a debt to mm-hmm. pipeline into my company. And that's it. Because anything else, why bother? Why wouldn't it? You're not like, no, that's what we're doing now, which is why when you see some companies, there are like diversity, equity, inclusion numbers are going up and then other companies are go down because we're just really recycling the same talent over and over again sure. instead of growing the talent pool. So I, you know, to specifically answer your question, I want companies to stay doing what yeah. they do and bring that versus trying to be something that they're not. Sure. I mean, I appreciate you saying that's probably a terrible idea. No, that's totally fine. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's not no, impossible. No, 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 I know, I know. I'm just being, I'm just being silly. Uh, I also think, you know, also like you made a point about GitHub. Like this isn't a gross thing to say. Like GitHub's product is developers of any kind, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Like sure, there's other like things that GitHub sells, but at the end of the day, like it, their product is their developers and using the platform and extending that influence of the platform to their companies and company adoption of said platform. Like that's. Right their business model to an extent. I'm curious too, like we focused a lot kind of like on that post high school graduation timeline, right? Like Mm -hmm. I know that there are 
magnet schools that are science focused. And I know that there are some extended schools for, you know, artistic kids. Like, what are your thoughts about like tech enabled schools or tech enabled programs in high schools? Are those, is that a good thing? Or is that something that, again, like we run into the same infrastructure challenge where it's like, okay, you have a hard time finding professors that can teach curriculum. Now try to find high school teachers to teach same curriculum. Yeah, no, tech focus, high schools, middle schools, lower schools, like all of them. I'm a big fan of them. That's also what you're talking about um, as well. When I'm looking at getting people into open source, mm-hmm. I think that there's a demographic of people that might be overlooked that I really want to focus on and tap yeah. into. And these are people that are career changers or retirees sure. who want to give back to communities. So I want to see it at the high school, you know, the elementary school level. But like you said, that's going to be a privileged school that's able to mm-hmm. offer this. But I wanted to be that the person that's retired from X, Y, and Z tech company, and they want to give back to a community, they come and learn open source, and they might go to a local library somewhere where students from a whole bunch of different schools can come to and they can teach them. So that's how you kind of, you know, people that want to stay, you know, keep their skills sharp, be involved in something. I think that open source is the part instead of them having to go and learn you know what i mean from these Mm -hmm. you know go to a four-year university and become a developer they can learn some basic skills that they can start introducing that to folks early in early. so you're never too early you see in india where they passed legislation like it's a policy now that computer science is starting in with their equivalent of kindergarten all the way up it has to be embedded there i think eventually we're going to get there you're going to see a lot more colleges that are going to say whatever your major is Yep. You have to take some basic tech and, and programming courses. So we're getting there. I think we're just, a, you know, a, a little bit behind there, but you're going to have to have it everywhere. Yeah, it brings up a, an interesting memory that I have. So when I was in college, I was a mentor for high school, local high school students that um, did senior projects. Mm-hmm. And one of the one of the students that I mentored, they did, a, they built a computer. So they learned all the components of a computer. And like, it's a really good, like getting started on like how computing works in general, in my opinion. Plus it opens you up for tons of opportunities for like entry level jobs, like working in help desk and IT and things like that. And I remember I, I had the privilege of being there when they did the presentation and I just saw the looks on the other students' faces as well as the teacher's faces. It's like, well, this isn't very like, they weren't, they weren't buying the whole pitch, right? Like if we enable technology early, it allows them, it allows folks to be successful. And I actually stood up and I said, I think every single student should have to take computer literacy in high school or earlier. And one of the teachers said, well, why would they do that? You're just teaching kids that like they have to get into tech. I'm like, well, no, but going forward in the next 20 years, you're going to touch computers for your job more than likely. So if mm-hmm. you have basic computer literacy, it's no it's no longer a barrier for you to get an opportunity. You know, yeah. I think that was obviously 10 plus years ago. And I think now nowadays it's probably more bought in that idea. But I think going back to what we were talking about with like your all in program, right? Mm-hmm. So like when you were standing that up, like wh- how f- like from your initial vision or your team's vision to like what you have now, like how much has it skewed and what did you learn from that experience? Oh, what a loaded question. I mean, so, well, um, <laughs> did I say that? well, the first thing is that all in has several components to yep. it, right? So you yep. have all in for students, which is this university program that, you know, I'll talk about. Then you have what's called all in for maintainers, where we did a maintainers listening tour. And so mm-hmm. that has some lessons learned. So I'll start with the university piece and, and kind of what we thought and kind of where we are now. So what I was thinking is that, hey, here are students. It looks like uh, we have some issues again. And Uh-oh. you're back. You're back. Are you able to hear me now? Yep. So you have these schools that, you know, might not be those five or six that I talked about every company is at. And another thing that I saw was that I was thinking, even at those schools, if you're in the top 10%, maybe 15% of your class, you're still going to find your way into tech. Sure. But GPA isn't the only aptitude for yes. success. And I knew that there were so many life experiences that might impact somebody's GPA that if you are in this school that nobody's recruiting at and you're not in the top 15%, you're just out of the talent pool. 
And I was thinking back to my college days where some of my friends who could program circles around everybody, sure. nobody was talking to them because their GPA just wasn't reflective of just the dope yeah. program. All right. Hopefully we'll get Demetrius back. Are you, yeah. You let me know. No, we're good. Yeah. You're just, you're, I don't know. The, yeah, uh, our, our, soft, our software of choice is, is uh, not not solving the problems we're looking for it to solve. But, I mean, okay. please continue. All right. Yeah, just yell it like you're doing if I, sure. if I break yep. it. So I wanted to solve for that is, you know, like expanding the talent pool. That's what I really yes. like. I, I, was, I was pretty tired of hearing, like, there's not a lot of talent out there. There's not a lot of talent out there. I was like, yeah, because you all are competing for the exact same talent. Mm -hmm. So how do we increase the talent pool? So that's sure. where I was looking at. And so I said, oh, well, if I go in there and if the team goes in there and we give these students access to open source, teach them all about open source one on one, give them a couple of classes and then give them some hands on experience. They're ready for internships. Yeah. That was kind of what the, the thought was. When we went in there, I think what was eye opening to me was a lot of the gaps that I knew about, but didn't know the extent of them. Sure. So what I mean by that was I was making assumptions and you know what they say about making assumptions that yep. everybody pretty much had a basic resume, right? Like yeah. there might be a couple of tweaks you might got to do to it, but some of the students we had to do major overhauls because someone had told them in high school or maybe even college that you just want to put your experience in chronological order. So sure. when we looked at these resumes, it might have been a lot of fast food experience or where yeah. you were, you know, worked at a gym and was a referee, like things like that. Mm -hmm. No tech experience. And so then we would have this. And so what they would do is submit resumes to these companies and these companies were like, oh, they don't have any tech experience. But what we did was actually spoke to each of the students. I said, tell me about your coursework. Tell me about yeah. your project. They had all of this amazing tech experience, but somebody had told them that a resume just needs to be in chronological yeah. order. Yeah. One page. So they made an assumption that the tech stuff needed to go off their classwork. And so it was amazing because we had a company that they went through the students' resumes very early on and didn't select a lot of them. Once we did those resume overviews and overhauls, yeah. these students were like, I mean, every... Quite honestly, I don't have enough students for all the companies that want to hire these students. Sure, you know, sure. You and I. So I'm, I'm, I'm literally uh, thinking through that. But it was some basic things like that. Like that comment I made earlier around not all computer science courses are created equal. I yep. assume that because we were focused on software and sophomores and juniors, that all of them had taken a programming class. So when we mm -hmm. got into the actual, you know, hands-on experience, some of them we had to go back and teach some of the basics. So sure. nothing wrong with it, right? It's just nope. where they are. So I think that's what surprised us. And so we had to do a lot more um, just foundational work. Yeah. But that helped me to understand sometimes that there's programs that when you take, you they give you a course and they give you a coupon code and you just take it and they send yes. you on your way. Yeah. That's not enough because yeah. you can teach somebody the substantive skills. You can teach people to, you know, the code. But if you're not giving them all of these other things and like really solving for whatever their, you know, whatever gaps they have, you're really not doing anything. You're just going to get somebody disenchanted with tech, sure. right? Because yeah. Like I did this and didn't, you know, get those jobs or whatever. Now, to suffice to say, for these students, we did a lot of work, mm -hmm. like a lot of We had a lot of partners. We had every last one of our corporate partners. They were giving resume reviews, interviewing one on one, teaching them things, the mentoring, all, like career panels. Like we did a lot of work. I'll be very clear with you. And, and I'm glad we piloted this and shipped to learn. Yeah. It's not sustainable, but sure. like you can't do this. Think about it. We had thousands of yeah. students that no, were trying to do this, right? You can only do this. Sort of so we're trying to now that we're moving into the, you know, the full kickoff this program. How do we balance that? Yeah. How do we make sure that we're just not giving students a coupon code and saying, go take this course and, and best mm -hmm. of luck to you. Versus making sure that we are understanding. And that's why open sourcing this is so great. Yep. So I've been talking to some of our corporate partners and I'm like, hey, if we have 50 students that need, you know, resume overhauls, can we send these 50 students to your TA team? And you got a TA team of 200 people. Sure. Can you all adopt these 50 students and do this? And if yep. we get five companies to do that, 
then you're getting, you know, your numbers and things like that. And that's why I like open source diversity, equity and inclusion for that. So that's how the program has evolved from what we thought it was going to be to where I think it's going to go in this next round. It's just balancing between scale and going deep with these students and impact. Um, because once we kind of went with them, kind of built that relationship with them, freaking amazing. Like, yeah. They're just amazing. For the maintainers piece of it, what we were hearing um, were things around, uh, and let me tell you why we focused on maintainers, right? Um, maintainers are, you know, when we talk to people about how do we advance diversity, equity, and inclusion in open source, back in those beginning conversations, everybody overwhelmingly said diversity, equity, and inclusion, it happens at that community level. Sure. Whether or not somebody feels included is dependent on their first few interactions within a community, whether or not they stay in open source, that community level. Who's the person that drives the culture for um, communities? It's the maintainers. They're like mm -hmm. the managers of a team, right? Those are the ones that are responsible for those day-to-day -day interactions. And so we wanted to, you know, focus on them. And in focusing on them, we were like, oh, they're tired and they're overworked and all these good things. They don't have access to resources yeah. and nobody's telling them what to do. And we started hearing some different things when we did the maintainer listening to it. They were like, no, we got resources. Like, that is not a problem. There's just so many of them. Like, yeah. we're getting unconscious bias and privilege conversations and all of these courses thrown at us. Like, our inboxes are overwhelmed with it. We don't know where to start. Yeah. And so that was something that we were like, oh, okay, that might be a little bit, you know, something that we hadn't heard a different nuance of it. We started looking at things like um, hackathons. And we were like, oh yeah, hackathons are great where, you know, these companies, you know, they pay these students or yeah. people in the profession to go out and just contribute to these um, open source communities. We heard from some maintainers that those things are the bane of their existence. Yeah. Like it's an yeah. intent versus impact thing. The intent is great. But sometimes you have all of these folks that are coming in, opening all of these issues and PRs and all those things in our, into our community that we need to sometimes spend like too much just to close yeah. all of them out. And they're mm -hmm. usually things that we didn't even need help with in the first yep. place, right? Yeah. And so helping, you know, bridge that gap, right, of something that has the potential to be really amazing, but making sure it's solving for the things that we wanted to solve for. Um, with maintainers, you know, I always thought access. When we talk about people in rural, you know, rural places and really internationally, we were thinking, oh yeah, people don't have access to infrastructure and internet and all those things. And so that's why companies were like, well, we can't be the one digging power lines. And, yeah, you know, of but what we heard from a lot of people internationally, they were like, no, we got access to internet. That's not the problem. It's the cost. Like oh. the cost for us to get on the internet and participate in these Zoom calls and things like that. So it's not that we don't have it. It's just cost prohibitive. Sure. That we can solve for, right? That doesn't require you to dig lines and those things. That requires you to get coupon codes and mm -hmm. go through GitHub sponsors to sponsor different yeah. projects so they can get money into the hands of people so they can participate synchronously yeah. and things like that. So those were some of the things that were surprising to us that we went in thinking that these were these big pervasive issues, but sure. really it's nuanced and you just need to ask that next level of conversation. Like those yeah. next level questions, like a lot of people like, oh, they don't have access and they just stop there and start thinking big, you know, infrastructure lines and internet cables, when really is they need $500 a year so that they can participate more inclusively into these communities yeah. and all those things. I, I mean, there's a lot to unpack there. And I think, you know, I wanted to, it's so right at the beginning when you were talking about the education kind of arm uh, of your program, like you mentioned something that I thought is is completely overlooked, not just in tech, but just like early in career folks in general. Like, yes, you need to build this knowledge base of like whatever your focus is. Like if you want to be a developer or if you want to be a sociologist or an anthropologist, like whatever, right? To build like this basic acumen of knowledge. But then there's all these things for you to get a career that no one really teaches you and that lots of companies make tons of money doing like interview prep resume right. review like access like talking about like hey mm -hmm. i can get you in with this particular company like you know there's a whole industries around these sort of tools right and i'm glad that there are some some of them that are um are not cost prohibitive but for the most part a lot of them are and I, so one of the things that i think like you mentioned github sponsors when you're talking more about maintainers right it would be great. And I imagine there's probably something like this that either GitHub has or other companies have. It's like, you know, that that moving it forward. It's like, hey, I'm the maintainer of a large project. Um, I would love to kind of open up 
or open source like my opinion on how to get a job in the communities that I know. Mm -hmm. Like these, like, because for the most part, you made a good comment earlier about maintainers and like you use the, the anecdote of like hackathons, like maintainers know their communities. Like that's mm -hmm. the reason why they've been able to build such a great mind share in their particular communities, but they don't know everything. Co big comp tech companies know their technology. Maybe they know their audience to an extent, but they also don't know everything. So it's mm -hmm. that kind of that, that cross pollination of ideas that really spurs levels of interest. Right. I mean, as somebody who is pretty active in open source, I see things like sponsors being great, but, but sponsors is just a small amount. Sure, some mm -hmm. people make a lot of money on sponsors, but nowhere near the amount as it should. Like I always cool. use the anecdote. It's like every project is a person or conglomeration of people. And as you go lower and lower down the dependency tree, the, the typically the smaller and smaller the project. So the less, the less visibility. So how do we get folks like that, that, you know, they have a small project that might be referenced by millions of GitHub projects. How mm -hmm. do we get them to to, to feel incentivized to contribute to, to community and open source. They might not want to. That's their decision. But how do we do that? How do we amplify mm -hmm. the voices of the small? You know, that's with the education piece and as well as this maintainers piece. Like, how do we do that? Yeah, and that's, and that's really what All In is, is doing. It's just giving voice to those that might not have the platform to be heard. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, and, and this is what, if I had to have this grand vision for All In, that's sure. how I imagine this to be, is just we kind of sit in the center and yeah. make all of those connections, yeah. amplify those that need that, that you might not be heard, make sure that those that might be larger communities, larger organizations, that they can hear the voices of those that understand how they're all dependent on each other or interdependent. Um, I think something that happened that... Um, it, it, you know, I had a mentor tell me this one time. He said, never let a crisis go to waste. Sure. And I think that with all of those cyber attacks and security breaches that have happened as of late, I think you started to see where companies realize the dependency that we yes. had on some of these smaller ones. And so I think that's where we're going to be able to leverage that. And a lot more companies are thinking, like, wait a minute, you have this small thing that is your company and your organization so dependent on. And it's been maintained and run by three people that are not getting paid. Like, yeah, is that really yeah. how you want to set this model up? So I yeah. think we're going to be able to leverage. And I, I was very pleased with um, the meeting that happened at the White House where a lot of the tech companies and their leaders, and especially in open source, they went and, and they're having conversations around that. And so I'm very, very optimistic yeah. that I think that that's going to be the catalyst, that crisis that we can start solving for these things. Yeah, maybe I'm a bit more pessimistic in that particular area because I think whenever you talk to a government, not just the U.S. government, but I think governments in general, they're, they're still thinking ways working inside their existing systems. And mm -hmm. technology, like the whole thing about technology, it does not work within any system. All it does is it irritates systems, right? Mm -hmm. Like whether it's particular industries, whether it's particular job markets, whether it's geographic locations, like all tech does is come in and set things on fire. Right. Yeah. So when you're talking to some, someone like, like just take, for instance, the U.S. government, the U.S. government is very rigid in how they want to handle particular things. So they're trying to fit something like tech into their framework. It's not going to work out very well unless you have people that are really thinking about the potentials that tech has. Not negatively, tech tends to exploit flaws in systems. So it's like, how do we, I guess put up situations where those exploitations are not damaging to the system in general. Yeah. And here's, here's a tricky part and it's relevant to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Unfortunately, the thing that gets people's attention are those crises, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you can have, um, you know, I've been talking about this um, lately to a few of my colleagues in which when you have something like the murder of George Floyd, that's when diversity, sure. equity, and starts to you know be to the forefront and everybody's yeah. on all those yeah. good things. the further and further you get away from something like that sure. like a lot of, I wouldn't say a lot of companies but talking to some of my colleagues a lot of companies now are they're starting to get you know kind of go back to okay we're cool yeah. on like we're doing good on diversity because that crisis isn't there 
And so when you have something very reactive like that, that's what happens. But I think the more and more, because these security breaches are not going to go away, right? These cyber attacks. And so that's what usually forces change. Like, and in an optimistic world, right? You will hope people like, hey, you see what is going to happen. Like we can see into the future, right? This thing is going to happen. Let's go ahead and get in front of it. But government and large bureaucratic organizations like that. And I have been a chief of staff for an elected official in government in Washington, D.C. So I say this sure. tongue in cheek. Um, sometimes that's what it takes, unfortunately. So yeah. it's going to happen. It's just going to be how long and it I, takes. And that's completely spot on. I think, too, like you mentioned something that I want to just hit on like very, very mm-hmm. quickly. Like society at large has a very short attention span. Mm-hmm. So the question is, and we're always distracted by everything, right? So, you know, you mentioned civil unrest in ma- many different demographics, right? Like you, in, if you talk about COVID, you talk about the current struggles that are going on in Europe, like the question always becomes, okay, how long until two things happen? Society at large decides, okay, I've seen enough of this. I'm going to go back to videos of kittens. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is, when's the next big thing that trumps this particular thing? Yeah. And I think one thing that's important is to, I don't want to say build a catalog of things that need to be addressed, but there are like different areas are more important to different groups, right? Like uh, that's just, unfortunately, that's just how things work. But in tech, I think tech has the opportunity because we only have one real goal, right? Mm -hmm. That one goal is to innovate society, right? That's my opinion of tech. So how do we innovate Mm -hmm. society? We champion movements. We can create tech. We can create systems that benefit the greater good. We Mm -hmm. can provide access to people. Like, and I think this is where I think tech is really, really important in that specific regard is that Tech needs to be an enabler of change, enabler mm-hmm. or amplifier of movements. And it seems to me, at least based on my opinionated view, it's literally just an attempt to seize moments and, and exploit them in some regards. And I, and I know we're almost running a lot of time. I know that's a very pointed statement to make, but I'd love to get your thoughts on like, as we close out, like how tech can be that enabler of change. Like what are some of the things that we can do in this space? I honestly think I don't want to go into tactical solutions. I want yeah, to of actually, course, of course. About this. I think tech needs to always be reminded of who we are. Like these, all those things that you mentioned that, that tech has the ability to do, remember that same thing, or as young folks, they keep that same energy for sure. diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Yeah. We know how to solve for this. We know how to solve for when things are siloed and, and you know, everybody's not working together and all those things. We've seen this before. Yep. So the only thing that I want tech to do is just bring the same enthusiasm, passion, the, the, the will to get this done in the same way that they've done for everything else, where you're talking about healthcare inequity, get into space. Um, you know, uh, automatic, uh, autonomous vehicles and cars, yeah. having robots bring your food to you. Yeah. Those things are not anything different. It's human behavior. There are psychologists, all those things. Bring everybody to the table. Tech is the great enabler of every single thing. And sometimes we forget that. We're looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion as this unsolvable thing. Mm-hmm. And that's just not the case. And so that's where I want tech to do. Just remember who you are. Don't try and be something that you're not. Bring people together, help leverage things, accelerate things, create the conversations, have the solutions, ship to learn, and don't be afraid of it. Step into it. That's that's what that's my great. whole brand thing for tech is. That's great. And as we wrap up, I think you know that's a great thing that we want to carry the conversation forward about. It's like, let tech do the heavy lifting, right? Because mm-hmm. it's that's what that's what it's made for. Like, mm-hmm. I can't calculate the next four thousand prime numbers, but a computer can in like ten seconds or less. Uh, so, I, Demetrius, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and chatting with me. Like, this is honestly, I'm not gonna. This is one of the probably the best conversations I feel like I've had on the show. I really appreciate it. Um, for folks that know how the show ends, I typically like to ask my guests if they can kind of encapsulate their feelings for 
tech and open source and the community around it, and you only had one word to do it, what would that word be for you? Can I put a hyphen in it, even though it's not sure. hyphenated? Sure, you can, you can have more than one word. I'll let it slide this one time. My words would be all in. All in. Let's be all in on diversity yeah. inclusion. Yeah. I, it, so for folks who aren't aware of all in, it's a get up program. It's specifically catering to diversity, equity, and inclusion. I highly recommend you check it out. In the show notes, there'll be a link to it. And Demetrius, I want to thank you again so much for being on the show. Do you have any parting words before we sign off? No, thank you for having me. This was such a delightful conversation. And anytime you want me to come back on, just let me know. Okay. Well, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out a time to get you on again, because again, I could have these sort of conversations every day. So again, awesome. I really appreciate your time. And for everybody tuning in, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. And we'll see you next time on Coffee and Open Source. Take care. Bye -bye.